London news agents. We know Donald Trump loves a lot of gold and guilt, but he hasn't got what King Charles has got, which is a gold coach. Donald Trump may have SUVs and police motorcyclists, but he doesn't have guards on horseback, all clinking brass and metal. Today, the state opening of Parliament, our version of what the Republicans are doing in Milwaukee, and we'll hear from Emily in a bit. But it is worth dwelling on the fact that this is the first Labour King speech, sovereign speech, state opening for 15 years. It is the first incoming Labour government's King speech since 1945. What did it mean? What was in it? Were there any surprises? And what clues does it give for, Star for what Starmerism is and what it means for the rest of us? Welcome to the News Agency. It's John. It's Lewis. And later on, we'll be hearing from Emily in uh, Milwaukee. And it's kind of funny, isn't it? The two different styles of pageantry. The sort of US style, which is kind of brash and balloons and ticker tape and all the rest of it. Loud music and our version of it at the state opening of Parliament, which is always, I always think is something slightly faintly absurd. I mean, a wonderful spectacle. I thought you liked pageantry. No, I, th I think... You changed your I tune think... from the coronation. No, 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 no. I think it's wonderful how we can be absolutely sure that at whatever time it is that the King's coach is due to turn into the Palace of Westminster, it will be at exactly that time. By God, if only we could get the trains to run in the same way. It seems that we can do... That's what Great British Railways is all about, John. <laughs> we can do the heraldic stuff beautifully and the costumes are amazing and all the rest of it. But it doesn't seem quite the 21st century. So let's uh, rewind a bit. If in case you're wondering what the King's Speech or the Queen's Speech or the state opening of, of Parliament is beyond the 2010 film with Colin Firth, it is, in fact, basically one of those slightly weird, arcane bits of the parliamentary calendar that happens... Roughly once a year at the start of a new parliamentary session, the parliamentary kind of term of the five years is divided into parliamentary sessions between a year and two years long. And at the start of every session, including just after a general election, the monarch, king or queen, opens parliament, does the state opening, they arrive in their full regalia, the House of Lords don their ermine, all of the commons are there, the king or queen summons the prime minister and the assembled MPs into the House of Lords chamber and they all gather round. It is the expression of our constitution, our constitutional settlement, the king in parliament, legislature, the judiciary, the bishops, the monarch all come together for this moment. And the king, the sovereign, reads out a speech and it's called the king's speech or the queen's speech. But in fact, it is nothing to do with them in the sense that Buckingham Palace don't write it, the king doesn't write it. The Prime Minister of the day, the, or the government of the day, I should say, writes it. And it is basically a list of all of the bills and bits of legislation that the government is going to bring forward in that parliamentary session. Well, the thing that struck me, and we'll play a bit of it in a moment, was when I heard the King say, my government's missions. <laughs> oh, my God, we're back to the government missions. We're back in the election campaign. Well, this is always the funny bit, is that basically because they just have to read it out completely expressionless, yeah. it is always funny to hear the monarch basically read out like the buzzwords of the day. So like, you know, when the Queen was there and Johnson had just come in talking about my government will level up, level up, the all this sort of stuff. We're talking about social justice under Blair. But yeah, it's this is what you, you basically just get a, a sense of the kind of the, the mo juice, the kind of buzzwords and the kind of emphases that a particular government of the day want to put on things. Well, let's hear from King Charles now. My lords and members of the House of Commons, my government will govern in service to the country. My government's legislative programme will be mission-led and based upon the principles of security, fairness and opportunity for all. Stability will be the cornerstone of my government's economic policy and every decision will be consistent with its fiscal rules. So in that, that gives sense, a flavour. <laughs> in that sense, that, that is a flavour. I mean, wouldn't it be remarkable if he said... My government is going to govern for the few and not the many. In the service of no one. In the service of no one. And we don't. We really hate stability. So we're going to govern in the most instable way possible. I mean, I, I, I happen to say, I think that, that the state opening, the King's speech is, I mean, of all the kind of parliamentary moments of the year, I think is, is the most empty in the sense that basically people always go, were there any surprises in the King's speech? And the answer is no, never. Because basically it's just a very, very glorified, very, very 
beautiful looking press release. It's basically them giving them a chance to re-announce everything that we already knew they were going to do with full the full imprimatur of royal regalia on top of it. So it's a sort of slightly weird day, but there are like tantalizing interesting little moments right so one of the moments is is that when black rod who is a person appears at the house of commons door and the doors famously are locked or knocked in their face closed in their face shut in their face which represents the idea that the monarch cannot come into or representative of the monarch cannot come into the house of commons chamber without being invited that all goes back to the civil war and all the events uh, around that then you do when the prime minister and the leader of the opposition emerge they have to have that friendly friendly banter. chats <laughs> as they yeah, walk to the to house of lords yes. how are you rishi <laughs> how are you since the election how are you since i thrashed you during the election <laughs> although actually they looked in very good spirits the two they, of them, they did they yeah. did and well look in a moment we're going to be talking to uh, bridget phillipson uh, the education secretary i was about to say the shadow education secretary the education secretary and women and equalities minister but i guess we ought to talk through some of the things that are in the king's speech yes and some of the things as well that are not. The two big headline grabbers, I suppose, are nationalisation of the railways. It was kind of previewed in the campaign. And the second one, and I think the most controversial one, is the reform of the planning laws, which kind of with this aim of building one and a half million houses over the next five years of this Labour government. And how easy will that be? How much controversy will it cause? How much opposition will there be, not just from Conservative MPs, but from some Labour MPs who now have constituencies with large rural areas as a result of the landslide election? It's no surprise, but nonetheless telling, that um, the very first thing that came out of the King's mouth was talking about the importance of economic growth and talking about the importance of planning reform. That was the thing that was leaked to all of the newspapers overnight. That's what all the splashes were in the morning. And it is a... I, th I think that this speech basically re-emphasises two things, right? It, it is that this government is going to live or die on the theory that supply-side measures, i.e. things like planning reform, are, will actually achieve growth in the short term and that it doesn't get bogged down in the way that we've seen previous governments get bogged down over things like planning reform because it's all very well sort of sitting there in Whitehall and saying yes we're going to have these centrally imposed targets yes we're going to back the builders yes we're going to come down like a ton of bricks against the 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 nimbys but of course actually once it starts to actually manifest itself with local authorities and so on once local authorities we're in the very early stage of this once local authorities start sending out letters to people and saying you know that bit of green land over yeah. there by you I'm afraid government, central government has imposed targets on us for housing and we are going to have to mandate that that is now going to be handed over to developers and so on. And then you start to see just area after area after area of people, local people, getting deeply, deeply pissed off, writing to their MPs, and suddenly all of that comes together, particularly in the digital age, and you have real backlash and real political problems very quickly. The other thing that I think it reminds us, this King's speech, is that um, we've got the, now got the most interventionist government for a decade. Yes, that's what it felt like, didn't yeah. it? About the targets and about the bodies that will be set up to kind of, you know, monitor this and monitor that. Yes, but I mean, like, Starmer is an interesting one, right, in the sense that he talks in the language and acts in many ways, language of moderation, technocracy, not having ideology uh, and so on. But if you if you just sit and think about the measures he's talking about, he's talking about, yeah, allowing much of the railway network to fall back into public ownership. He's talking about having Great British Energy, which is a, as a state-owned energy investment sort of backup vehicle. He's talking about... It's, it's a government which is reflexively, for the first time in decades, perfectly happy to intervene here, intervene there, talk about industrial policy. And even though they don't have much money to do it, they are, in principle, very happy to get their hands dirty and to say that Whitehall is going to impose economic policies, is going to impose its will and its writ and intervene in the economy on a day-to-day -day basis in a way that actually we haven't seen for many, many decades. Well, I mean, one of the other things that's going to happen is that there's going to be a, a football regulator and it's sort of kind of getting involved in areas where you think, does the government really need to be involved in this? And I, the government has calculated that, you know, there is so much that goes wrong with football teams or whatever it happens to be in any area of life that you do need to have sort of their people that are trying to enforce the rules. And you see what has happened with Offwatch and what's happened with the water companies where people think, my God, nothing happened. Nothing happened at all. And this is why so many of the water companies are in such a mess and pumping sewage into our rivers and 
see and all the rest of it. I think, in a way, it strikes me more and more that um, Starmerism, if we can start talking about that, it feels more and more like the opposite of Blairism, in yes. one sense, right? Which I is agree. that that means that Starmerism is both very old Labour and very new Labour at the same time, in a sense that, yes, there is no doubt that this is a government that is far more interventionist, more class conscious in a lot of ways. It is happy for the state to meddle more profoundly in order to achieve its aims, which it says are, are economic growth. It thinks it needs a strong central state, albeit tampered by devolution, they say. We'll see if that that works out. That is something that actually Blair and Brown were far more reluctant to get involved in. You know, we wouldn't have seen something like Great British Energy in the Blair-Brown days. We would never have seen the railways coming back into public ownership. They would have been far more circumspect about talking about an industrial policy and so on. So there's that. But the way in which Blair and Brown were much more old Labour in some sense, they were happy to flash the cash. I mean, they could do so. They had the cash, right? They would, when they wanted to intervene, when they chose to on big... The investment big, in the health service. Yeah, on big, big projects. When they did, they backed it up with a load of cash. It was far more traditional, quietly. It was far more traditional tax and spend. Now, whether Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves would like to do that if they had the money, that's a separate question. They probably would. But they don't feel they do have the money. So in that respect, they say, at least for now, they are not going to be traditional tax and spend labour, but they are highly interventionist in the way that they approach the economy in terms of all of these things that we're talking about. But of course, I suppose that is kind of speaks of the different historical times Yes, that we were in then and we're in today when then uh, the whole idea of globalisation was seen as the most wonderful thing that these kind of emerging yes. economies, yes. Indonesia, Vietnam, South Africa, wherever it happened to be, would be the engines of economic growth, which would be, lead to great new export markets for the UK and selling of services and all the rest of it. We'd give up on manufacturing. It would all be fine. And then you see the financial crash where you think, oh, my God, well, actually, maybe we do need to intervene. Maybe we do need to be protecting some of our industries a bit more. And then you have COVID where supply lines were overstretched and you couldn't get your hands on any of the kind of vital PPE equipment. That the you state wanted. is back. The state and is so back it's not now. surprising in one sense, given that that a Labour government, which is coming on with a big majority, is far more comfortable psychologically, politically talking about being a bit statist and not being afraid yeah. for the state to flex its muscles, albeit in a highly constrained f fiscal environment. Well, we are joined now by Bridget Philipson, uh, the Education Secretary and Women and Equalities Minister, and delighted that you could join us on the news agents. Lewis and I were just talking before you came into the studio, and we were saying, what is it that defines Starmerism? And we kind of wondered whether it was fair to say that the state is back. I think there is a central role where it comes to what we can do from the heart of government. I mean, that does have to go hand in hand uh, with local powers too. Where we've set out big and ambitious plans around devolution and skills is one area where we need to do a lot more with our regional mayors as well as a country. But there are some decisions that are best taken centrally because you secure that impact. Planning reform is, is one obvious way. And the planning reform one is obviously going to be the most controversial. And the Telegraph ran... A quite a comprehensive story at the weekend about how kind of half the cabinet have raised objections at various times to planning proposals in their own backyards, which doesn't augur well, does it, for getting one and a half million houses built in the next five years? Look, Labour ministers have already got on with the job of approving some decisions that have been sat on desks awaiting decisions for far too long. And you know, housing decisions, but also ending the ban on onshore winds. So we've already got on and done that. But there is more that needs to happen. And that's why the King's Speech today sets out our plans to get more homes built. We've got a mandate to do it. We secured the trust of the British people and we're determined to make it happen. But is the Prime Minister, Bridget, is, would he expect his members of Parliament, especially his ministers, but even his members of Parliament, not to be, as a matter of course, as is often the case with MPs, opposing development in their constituencies? Look, as constituency members of parliament, you will often, on behalf of constituents, raise concerns that they might have. That's a perfectly normal process that happens. But we do need to get on and build homes. We want to work with local communities to do that. But we need homes desperately. We absolutely do. Far too few young people ha are having the chance now to buy a home. We know that there are too few homes where it comes to affordable and social rent as well. And that's damaging children's life chances across our country. It's causing real problems for families and we are determined to put that right. We secured that mandate in the election to do it and today marks the start of the full start of that process. Can we talk about a couple of things that aren't in the King's speech? 
the two child cap on child benefit. I know this is a King's speech for the next parliament. Would it be a failure on the part of the Labour government if by the time of the next election that hasn't been lifted, given the dramatic effects it's had on the numbers of children in child poverty? What we are all determined to do and what I came into politics to achieve is a reduction in the number of children growing up in poverty. It scars life chances. It holds back our country. And that's why today we've announced that there will be a task force working across government to tackle these issues. I'll be working with Liz Kendall, our Work and Pensions Secretary, co-chairing this task force to make sure that all of us are focused on the measures and the steps that we can take to drive down child poverty. And one area that we've set out today within the King's speech is universal free breakfast clubs in all of our primary schools. That will make a big difference to families in what is still a really tough environment. But alongside that, it's how we will deliver better attendance in our schools and high and rising standards, because also the the evidence is clear about the academic outcomes that that arise too. Of course, I understand that. But do you think it is desirable in and of itself to lift the cap on child benefit for two children? This is not a policy that we introduced. This was a commitment from the previous Conservative government. I understand that, but But I'm just wondering what you think about, is it desirable to lift the cap? The challenge that we face at the moment is that the fiscal inheritance is dire. Now, we knew that before, and then when we've arrived into departments having the real privilege to serve as secretaries of state, that has made the situation... Uh, The situation is abundantly clear. And on, on specifically... No, we, we we did not we went we did not introduce this measure. I do not want children in it. our country to be growing up in poverty because we will govern as we campaigned, which is we will only make change where we are absolutely confident and sure we can do that and how we do that in a responsible way. But absolutely I, you can judge you can judge us as a government on whether we start to make progress in bringing down the number of children growing up in poverty. It is too high at the moment. It, it is terrible for children and families. I mean, it it, it is heartbreaking and I've, you know, it is appalling. But alongside that, we want to get this right. We are determined to get this right. I understand that, but I'm surprised you won't even answer the question whether it is desirable or not to lift the cap, which you are saying, look, it wasn't us that introduced it. We've got other things. We've said we're governors, we campaigned, etc. I understand all of that. But is it desirable to lift the two child cap? We didn't introduce it. That was not our policy. And alongside that, there will now. be a range of measures. There will be, there will be a range of measures because you're retaining it. There will be a range of measures that we will bring forward in order to bring down the numbers of child poverty. We've set out the start of that process today with the launch of the task force that Liz Kendall has launched. We'll work right across government to do that. And the measures we set out today as well around rights at work are a really important part of that too. We know that too many people in our country work hard go out to work every day and yet still can't afford to provide for their families. That is the legacy of 14 years. Families turning up at food banks to provide for the basics because they're not earning enough when they're working. And that's why the ambitious set of measures that we've set out today around workers' rights will be a central part of how we make sure that work wants more pays. In the King's speech today, it did have some constitutional measures in it, not least the abolition of of hereditary peers. Um, No mention, though, of something that was... Uh, a policy pledge of yours in the election, which is votes at 16. Is that still going to happen? We hold to our manifesto commitments. What you'll understand is that there's a question of timing and timetabling of of various measures and there is finite space uh, within what is set out by the King himself uh, when he addresses Parliament. But we remain committed to delivering on our our manifesto, absolutely. It is going to happen. It will happen before before the end of this Parliament. Uh, we are determined to make that happen. It was a key commitment in our manifesto and that, and, and, and other areas that perhaps might not have featured in the speech itself today. We are determined to bring so, forward. But it's yes. a yes, it will happen. Yes, it will happen. But this is the first, this Understood. is the first stage of our legislative program. Fine. Just one other thing. There's a kind of lot of disquiet. Let me put it like that about the role that Sue Gray, uh, the Prime Minister's chief of staff in opposition and now in government, is playing that she is overmighty, that she seems to be ta- playing too big a hand in the appointment of ministers, has got involved in kind of green lighting, a redevelopment of a sports site in Northern Ireland, which is causing a huge amount of uh, turmoil. What I would say ab- about individual members of staff and the conversation that I can have with you today, I-, I understand why you're asking these questions, but I do think it's a bit unfair. And it's a bit unfair were I to talk about individual staff because they don't have the right of response. They can't come on a programme and talk to you. And I don't think it's really fair or or right 
for secretaries of state to be talking about staff in those terms. What I can say is that all of us together, that's both politicians and our staff team, are working together really hard to deliver on the plans that we set out in that manifesto. And we will seek to do so Secretary in a way that is yeah. about professionalism and working with officials alongside that, as well as our party teams too. But I'm afraid I'm not going to get into okay. talking about individual that, members of staff. I'm just not prepared to do that, I'm afraid. That, and just finally, Education Secretary, I mean, you will have um, seen um, the uh, selection of J.D. Vance, the the, uh, the running mate for, for President Trump for the upcoming election. What, what was your reaction when you heard him say that he thought that the UK under Labour might be the first truly Islamist country with nuclear weapons? What was your reaction to that? I mean, I'll be honest, I was genuinely mystified. I'm really unclear why he would have said that. Um, but, you know, the, the election will play out in the US. It's for the American people to decide who they want to be their president, their vice president, and we'll work with um, we'll work th with the successful candidates. It doesn't augur well for our relations, though, with that administration, does it, if that's what the vice president might think about us? I think the relationship between our country and the US has is about more than individuals. That's always been, you know, what we've what we've worked we, we've worked together over many many decades, irrespective of personalities, and we're determined to work with whoever the American people choose to lead their country later on this year. Bridget Phillipson, so good to have you on the news agents. Thank you very much, indeed. Thank you. Grateful to you. Thank, thank you. you. So I thought that was really interesting. I thought the difference between opposition and government. You know, yes, sixteen to eighteen voting will happen, but strange that she wouldn't even say it's desirable to lift the two child cap. Yeah, which is something that other Labour uh, figures have hinted at. I think in a way it adverts to one of the kind of weirdnesses of today as a parliamentary day and as a political day, which is that in a sense, having a King's speech without having had a budget is a bit odd because in a way it's kind of half the battle. Like the, the sort of two levers you have as, as a government, or two of the big ones anyway, is obviously legislative Legislation. change, which yeah. is the King's speech, and fiscal measures, which yeah. is the budget. And Rachel Reeves has elected not to have, as say George Osborne did in 2010, not have an emergency budget or a summer budget as an early indication of intent. She said she, she hasn't done so because she wants the OBR to have the full time to score it and all that sort of stuff, which is a bit of a legacy of the Liz Trust period. Personally, I think that that's a bit of a mistake because I think you've got that early period, that early flush of being a new government and actually it's time to set the agenda. But anyway, it does just mean that with questions like the two child benefit question, which is fundamentally a fiscal question, it means that you've got Labour ministers out on the airwaves a bit uncertain as to how they can and should yeah. respond to individual big fiscal measures like that. The other thing I thought was your question about what J.D. Vance had said. Yeah, I was surprised she said that. I mean, I, the classic, in a pleasant way. <laughs> I mean, in a pleasant way. Don't don't. But the 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 super media trained uh, politician would have said, "Look, I have been so busy with my own brief, I haven't heard what J.D. Vance has said. You quoted. I don't know the context of his remarks. I've got nothing to add." Well, let us catch up now with what is actually happening in Milwaukee. Emily will be here for us in just a moment. Donald Trump has my strong endorsement, period. That was Nikki Haley on the convention floor last night. And here's a reminder of what she used to sound like just four short months ago. Of course, many of the same politicians who now publicly embrace Trump privately dread him. They know what a disaster he's been and will continue to be for our party. They're just too afraid to say it out loud. Well, I'm not afraid to say the hard truths out loud. I feel no need to kiss the ring. Her story is the story of what's happening here this week. They have all succumbed, or pretty much all. This convention, this party, is now Trump. So last night, three of the presidential candidates who tried to take on Trump took to the stage to praise Trump. Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy were once hoping to replace the man or at least become his vice presidential pick. We grabbed a word with Vivek just before his speech. The choice of VP. I think he's a great choice. And Are I you think disappointed that, that you're not in well, there? I mean, I'm a human being, <laughs> but, but I would say JD's a great choice. And I, and Are you going to be in the cabinet? For a long time. We're going to help save this country in a big way. There's a lot of options. What's the job? And stay tuned. 
That's what you have to say if you want a future in this party. Both Nikki and Vivek are going through this humiliation because they believe they can run for president in 2028. Yes, make no mistake, it's not this election they're thinking about, but the next. There are a few candid souls who are, frankly, refusing to sell out. One's the former Arkansas governor, Asa Hutchinson, himself a presidential candidate, and a man who's now wandering around the convention with no security, no minder, a man on the outside trying to warn his own party what they are about to become. I have not endorsed Donald Trump. I've not said I will vote for him, although that option and that uh, I'm still considering what I should do in November. So you might still vote for Donald Trump? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, making any announcements on that today, and I, I want to keep my options over the future because uh, I've said I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden. I'm going to vote for a Republican, but I'm not going to vote for a convicted felon. So where do I belong? I cannot tell you how rare it is to hear one person refer to Trump as a convicted felon, which he is before the law. Most simply refuse to believe he's done anything wrong, calling it persecution, like he's Nelson Mandela. That division between old school Republicans and the Trump acolytes boiled over yesterday, a heated row between the man who used to be Republican royalty, Kevin McCarthy, former Speaker of the House, and the Florida congressman now being investigated for underage sexual misconduct, Matt Gates. McCarthy has vowed not to let Gates run for governor. How's that going? Kevin McCarthy said he's going to keep you off the ticket to run as governor in Florida. What's your response to Kevin McCarthy? I've, I, I don't know that he gets much say in who gets to run for governor of Florida. Right now I'm running for re-election to the House of Representatives and uh, Kevin McCarthy is spending a million dollars every week against me and he's failing hilariously. Uh, I'm going to defeat my opponent, I'm going to be re-elected to the House and I've got no current plans to run for governor. What's your message to Kevin McCarthy today? Uh, you know, behave better. Do you think that it's still Kevin McCarthy's party? Does he have a place in the modern Republican Party? Kevin McCarthy went from believing he was going to be the chairman of this event to not even being invited to speak at it. Like Kevin McCarthy isn't even going to be taking that stage. And if he did take that stage, he would be booed off of it. So this is just a MAGA party now. It's not a Republican party anymore. It's a MAGA party. Well, MAGA is MAGA's very inclusive. I mean, think about... Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, even J.D. Vance, a former critic of President Trump, now uh, coming to be part of, of this great experience. So we're in a time of political realignment. In that blessed family box, on one side of him is, you've guessed it, Matt Gates. On the other, a fellow Florida congressman, Byron Donalds. He's a close confidant of Trump. They talk frequently. There are few here who know him better. You were in the box with um, him yesterday yeah. when Donald Trump walked in. Did the president seem different to you? It seemed a very emotional moment. Uh, I, I think the moment, he recognized the moment for what it was. Um, your first, uh, not just public appearance, your first international appearance um, after the failed assassination attempt. And so, you know, I think for him, it was big. But no, him, knowing him, he's focused. Do you think it's changed him? I'm not sure about change. I think that it has, in his mind, raised the stakes of how crucial this election is. And not just about him per se, but he truly is fighting for all of the American people. And so, you know, I think if anything, all it's done is it's, it's, focused, uh, it's focused him, it's increased his resolve. He is ready to not just win this election, but do the job of leading this country for four more years. This convention is not the scrappy, insurgent affair it was eight years ago before Trumpism was a thing. This is a slick, well-oiled machine. No politician can walk a corridor without a minder and a Secret Service agent. The speeches are short, tight, timed. The gaffes, in all honesty, few. There is always a problem with being on the inside. You succumb to bubble mentality, start believing all the flag-waving, all this talk of victory. Bear that in mind when I say the campaign here believe they've got this. Corey Lewandowski was Trump's first campaign manager. Look, this is the party of Donald Trump. We are completely unified across the board from uh, anybody who may have been part of the moderate wing of the party to the most conservative wing of the party. This is Donald Trump's party. We are completely unified. 
We have seen the devastation that the Biden administration has incurred on this country for the last three years, and people are ready to move forward with a new vision for America, unified, not just amongst conservatives, not just amongst Republicans, but the entire country unified, and we're seeing that now behind Donald Trump. Nikki Haley and Donald Trump were enemies uh, on the campaign trail. So was Dr. Carson and Donald Trump. So was Rick Perry and Donald Trump. And those enemies became friends. So was J.D. Vance. So was, look, many people didn't support Donald Trump when he came down that beautiful golden escalator, you know, nine years ago. I was the guy that did, there's no question about it, but many didn't. But we love those converts because they've learned what I knew then, that Donald Trump is the best leader for this country. So what of the Democrats this week waking to news that Biden is now struggling in 14 key states, that the race is affecting not just the presidency, but the Democratic candidates further down the ballot? Are they still prepared to sit on their hands, do nothing? No one is pulling the emergency cord. One senior diplomat spelt out to me yesterday what is becoming obvious, that those Democrats who could have replaced Joe Biden may be thinking they'd be better served to sit this round out, except this election is Trump's. Do a Nikki Haley, in other words, and come back in 2028, as the world gets used to this double whammy, Trump Vance. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 